Uh, next presenter is Dr. Melinda Power, and she's an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology at George Washington University, Northern Institute School of Public Health. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I know that I am the, the midpoint of a long afternoon block after a delicious lunch. Um, and I come from a public health background, and the more I learn about disease, the more I learn the answer is probably move your body and eat vegetables. So if anyone needs to stand up and stretch, you know, feel free. Um, I want to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and I am so happy to see from our previous speakers discussion of the exposome and environmental risk factors. That was my first love. I've trained both in epidemiology and environmental health. We'll still do a little bit of work in that space. Okay. Um, and I also want to uh, thank Dr. Romano for using our uh, Geotasio Power Dementia Source, which I'll talk about a little bit today. But if anyone wants more information about those, we can chat. So today I'm going to talk about analytical considerations for equitable ADRD research, um, specifically focusing on combining samples and identifying ADRD. So a couple of disclosures. I have research funding, comes from the usual suspects. Um, I was a paid member of the Biogen Healthy Climate, Healthy Lives Advisory Board, based on that kind of environmental work that I've done before, but I'm no longer a part of that. And I'm currently a 2022-2023 Health and Aging Policy Fellow, which has been a really eye-opening experience. So, you know, we're all here because we're interested in doing equitable ADRD research, right? And it really requires all of the things that any research requires. It requires attention to bias. It requires careful measurement. It requires sampling that makes sense, representative populations. But I would argue that ADRD research um, may be singularly susceptible given the need to reach uh, subgroups of interest, right? We end up with very small sample sizes. We have um, the need for long-term longitudinal data and so this just really kind of makes this more challenging in this context. So as I mentioned, we often need large enough samples to limit the potential for chance or unclear findings. And that's particularly tri tricky when you're looking at non-majority class populations. And this, you also need careful attention to the sources of bias. So I'm gonna focus this presentation about talking about how can we overcome the issue of these small sample sizes in existing data sets or the fact that it just takes a long time and a lot of effort to recruit people. So getting large sample sizes is hard. There are a couple of, you know, quote, unquote, easy options, things that are feasible within an NIH budget. Um, and these often include, and I'm going to limit this to secondary data analysis today because there's, there's lots of options if you're doing primary, but today I'm going to talk about secondary data. And some of these easy options are one to combine samples, right? We've got samples from all over the country. Why not stick them all together? You can do that through meta-analysis, individual data level, individual level data pooling, uh, simulation or synthetic samples. There's lots of options there. You can rely on administrative data, right? It was said at the beginning of this talk, I'm sorry, I don't remember who, the amount of data available to us has just been growing exponentially, right? We have access to genomic data, EHR, Medicare claims, all sorts of administrative data that can be linked to other data that we have. Although it wasn't collected by re for research purposes, it can be really powerful. And then we can have this idea of algorithmic ADRD diagnoses and large representative cohorts, which allows you to get information or classifications on people for whom you don't do a full workup, right? Because ascertaining dementia is a time-consuming process. And so if you can use these algorithmic approaches, you can do things like Dr. Amano's work in the health and retirement study. Now, each of these easy options raises issues of bias that we wanna be aware of. And it's not to say that we shouldn't be doing these, it's just that we want to be doing them carefully. So if we think about combining samples, um, the issues are include issues with harmonization, including measurement error, residual confounding, and issues related to selection bias and generalizability. We think about administrative data or algorithms. The big elephant in the room here is differential misclassification, right? Are our measurements contributing to us getting the wrong answer? And I'm gonna go through each of these in turn. So we'll start, start about the, the possibility of combining samples, right? Really attractive. We've got a bunch of samples from all over the country. Can we just build a larger cohort that kind of gives us the sample size that we need to do, answer the questions we might have? So the first thing I wanna talk about is harmonization. And if any of you have ever tried to actually harmonize two data sets, you know that this sounds easy, 
but is actually ridiculously hard. It requires similar measures and requires assumptions about measurement equivalence. And these are really tricky things to know. When, when is it okay to make this assumption? And when is making this assumption gonna be problematic? And it can be problematic even for situations where you think you have measured the same thing. So this is an example from Eric and Adney. Um, Adney is a highly phenotyped uh, sample, a lot of biomarker data. Eric started off as population representative from four communities in the United States. You know, two data sets that, you know, if we could figure out a way to crosswalk between them, could be really powerful. They both have a measure of the Boston naming test, the cognitive test. They both have measures of the Boston naming test that include 30 items. But if you look at the fine print, they include a different set of 30 items. And they were scored slightly differently. So are we okay saying that these measures are equivalent? Anyone want to take a stand? Same thing with the next example, hypertension history, right? We should, it seems straightforward. Like, has this person had hypertension? But no, right? So in Eric, we define that based on measuring people's blood pressure when they come in for study visits every couple of years, taking a medication inventory, um, things of that nature. Whereas hypertension history in Abney was assessed by a clinician who asked, you know, did a physical exam, asked a lot of questions, um, and looked at medical records. Do we really think that the people who are labeled as having the hypertensive history would be the same under those two approaches, right? So my recommendation here, and I'm not gonna just go, hey, there's all these problems. I'm gonna give you recommendations because I really truly believe we have to overcome these issues, right? So my first recommendation is think about some common core measures of protocols in addition to your study specific measures. Not new, not a new recommendation, but we have a tendency to wanna to do the latest, the greatest, the best. Sometimes having consistency is worth avoiding going to that place. Um, and also I wanna note that harmonizing is really only appropriate for representative samples from the same source population. And how we define that can be pretty broad, but let's, let's kind of at least start from a place that we think that these are all members of an underlying population that we can define. The next example is residual confounding. So when you have different samples, uh, one of the things that I have found is that the confounding structure is often unique to your sample, right? different place, different characteristics, different time periods, different sampling strategies, they result in a confounding structure that's often unique. So the actual numbers in this table are not important, but what I want to point out here is that what we did was we looked at a linear mixed effects model, looking at the impact of HbA1c on cognitive change. We did it in two different samples. We did it in ERIC and we did it in HRS. And I just pulled out the relevant parameters from that model, right? So there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there, but age is our time scale. So that's the first line. HbA1c, we have two measures of that. So we did a linear spline, uh, cutting it off at 6.5, which is the diagnosis of, of diabetes threshold. Um, and then the age times HbA1c interaction, right? That interaction term is typically, as epidemiologists, the one that we're interested in. It's does the cognitive change differ depending on where your HbA1c is? Now you can see we've got our parameters from ERIC, we've got our parameters from HRS. This was actually a study that did pooled synthetic data with imputation and adjustment for cohort. And you can see in that third column, the numbers are kind of right in between, right? Like you'd expect, they should be in between. We're combining two samples and we would hope that the average of those two samples would be a number in between those two samples. If we don't adjust for cohort, if we don't adjust for not only the main effect of cohort, but the interaction between cohort and all of our confounders, we don't see that anymore. Those orange numbers, out of range, right? Indicating to me that there was confounding structures that were different that we needed to take account for. <coughs> Excuse me. So the recommendation here is that we need to think about differences in confounding structure, especially when samples are drawn from different source populations. And this is gonna underlie a later recommendation where I say maybe we wanna stick with something, the meta-analysis as opposed to the pooled approach, right? And you don't lose a lot of power, but it allows you to deal with this better. Um, generalizability. So here's a, a paper that we did where we took 
Eric data and Adney data, and I introduced those cohorts earlier. And we just ran a kitchen sink of regression models. And we said, how often do these two samples produce effect estimates that are anywhere close to each other? So this is just a, a one plot of many in this, in this paper. And you can see that this is for the odds ratio for the association with low Boston naming test scores in harmonized Eric and Adney data. Um, and it's for all of those exposures on the side. So right here, we've got some sociodemographics some genetics, physical health and imaging measures. Um, I believe, I don't see my legend right here, but I believe uh, Eric is in orange and Agni is in blue. But if I'm wrong about that, I apologize. Reference paper. And you'll notice that there are a number of cases here where we get different answers, right? We don't get overlapping confidence intervals. We don't necessarily get even the same direction of association. And if we do this for the kind of kitchen sink approach, the proportion of associations that differed across Eric and Adney and harmonized data were quite significant. Um, so if we think about defining difference in terms of statistical significance, so right, that interaction between cohort and the exposure, 34% um, of all associations were significantly different by cohort. And that went up to about 50% if we restricted to the place where at least one cohort had a signal, right? So, because if null is null is null, you're not going to see anything anywhere. Um, and then we had even about 50% among all associations or among significant associations, if we think about it on, uh, quantitatively. So like a difference in point estimates that's meaningful. So the recommendation here is that representative samples are really important. Um, and that if you are familiar with the transportability literature, transportability is not necessarily feasible when there's selection on the outcome or unknown selection factors which goes back to this need for representative samples. ADNI has been great, right? It's given us this highly phenotyped data. It doesn't necessarily gonna replicate in the general population. And what we need at the end of the day are things that work in the general population. And then we've had a couple of people talk about selection bias, right? Um, marginalized populations are often wary of research participation for good reason. And those who enter the sample may not be representative of the target population. Now I'm going to ignore all of the primary data collection efforts that people are doing because there are people who have thought about this deeply. How do you overcome this in terms of primary data collection? <laughs> but when you're dealing with secondary data, you're kind of stuck with the people you have. So you wanna think about this, right? Is there some situation where the exposure and the outcome were both related to selection bias? And that is somehow related to the subgroup that you are interested in. Um, and for those of you familiar, this is a DAG. It's a very standard selection DAG. It's something that we just need to pay attention to. And there are a variety of statistical methods that we can do to at least understand how bad this could be, right? We're not necessarily going to say, and now we have the right answer. But we can say, yeah, there's probably a bias, but it probably doesn't completely negate what we're finding, which it can and it has. So again, I'm gonna harp on this. I'm a big fan of representative samples. I think that's what we need. Um, I know that we're moving to other data sources, but as much as we can get there, I, I really do think this is valuable and important. So leaving behind combining samples, let's talk about other data sources, right? These big data sources that are all the rage, right? They're, they're wonderful. They give us so much, so much more information than we had previously, but we have to be careful about how we use them. So reliance on algorithmic ascertainment or administrative data, especially to identify dementia is increasingly common. And that's because it's really useful, right? It avoids the expense and time associated with in-person data ascertainment. Um, it can be applied retroactively, right? If you've got a study that's 20 years old, you can figure this out now and go back and, and figure out when people develop dementia during your 20 years of follow-up. And you can apply it both in cohort data and administrative data. So it can be really, really powerful. So I started thinking about, you know, this is great. How can we make sure that we're using it well? And I had a, a grant to look at um, just kind of quantifying dementia, race ethnic disparities in dementia over time for the purposes of surveillance, right? This idea that if we're going to make progress in, in shrinking disparities, we should probably have some way to measure that. 
So I wanted to use HRS because HRS is a nationally representative sample. Not a lot of those out there wanted to do this on the national level. And I went out and I found that there are there were six kind of algorithmic processes that were used with the HRS data to identify dementia. Because HRS itself doesn't do a formal dementia after chemo. They have cognitive testing, they have medical history, they have all sorts of other things, but they don't do dementia after chemo. So we need some way to actually assign dementia status to people. So the first two that I'll just call Herzog-Wallace and Lingo-Kabata-Weir after the creators, basically just added up cognitive test scores, applied a cutoff. Below this, you have dementia. Above this, you don't. The regression-based analyses used a subsample called ADAMS, where they did do that formal dementia um, ascertainment, this criterion standard approach. Um, and what they did is then they took HRS covariate data, predicted dementia status in ADAMS, and then used that regression model to assign dementia status to the cohort at all. And then the last is Medicare claims, right? We can link Medicare claims to HRS, and we can um, take that set of ICD-9 claims with a three-year look-back period. The Taylor definition, and Dr. Taylor's in the audience, has been commonly used in many places. Um, and you can use that for, for ascertaining dementia. Now, the creators of all of these are going to give you some caveats, right? Medicare claims. It's diagnosed dementia, not just dementia, right? These score cutoffs. Well, it doesn't really get at function. It really only gets at cognition. So maybe we should just call this cognitive impairment. But the way that they're used in the literature is as, do you have dementia or not? Now, in order to understand whether it's appropriate to use for, for a given purpose, and specifically for my purpose, I wanted to understand the measurement properties of these algorithms. Because there are six of them. Which one should I use? Which one's going to be best? And if I want to, to quantify racial disparities in dementia, one of the things I didn't want to do was quantify measurement error in my tool, because that's not useful. So if you think about thinking about the measurement properties of these, we, we have some tools to do that. Remember, we have this atom sample. And so what we did is I took all of these algorithms, assigned dementia status based on them, and compared them to the criteria standard assessment in the substudy. And what we found is that these algorithms typically have high specificity, very low sensitivity, and that the performance varied wildly by both race, ethnicity, and a variety of other characteristics that I considered. And I said, well, that's not terribly useful for what I want to do. Now, it might be fine for some purposes, but not when I'm specifically looking at thinking about racial ethnic disparities. Um, and then this is just an example. So the performance metrics of this is particularly Medicare claims as compared to as research classification by participant characteristics. You can see relatively low sensitivity, relatively high specificity, reasonable accuracy, but pretty dramatic differences across different characteristics, especially in terms of sensitivity. So what we did is we said, I think we can do a little better, at least a little better for our purpose. And we created an algorithm that has similar sensitivity and specificity across racial ethnic groups as defined by the HRS and prioritized higher sensitivity over higher specificity. Because I thought capturing people who truly had the disease was more important than maybe including a few who were maybe on the border, right? Who didn't have the disease, but for some reason got pulled in anyway. So we created these three algorithms. I loosely call them the expert model because um, I just looked at things and said this should go in the model. Lasso, uh, which is a machine learning technique, and a modified version of the herd algorithm that was created by um, Rand, I believe, Dr. Michael Arner. Yeah. Um, and what we did then is just to evaluate this is we ran the prevalence ratios from a variety of exposures on dementia and compared the answer we got for each of those algorithms. So the only difference, I'm gonna take you through this because there's a lot of deaths, but they should be relatively easy. The black dot is what we get from Adams, criterion standard. Not gold standard, because nothing's perfect, but criterion standard, the best we think we can do right now. The blue dots, those are the five existing algorithms that uh, used cohort data to predict dementia status in Adams. The green dots are the three ones that we made up. And then the orange dot is using Medicare claims. The only difference between those dots is the choice of algorithm. Sample size is the same, the adjustment is the same, the parameterization of every other covariate is the same, everything's the same except choice of algorithm. And you can see that choice of algorithm actually makes a pretty big difference sometimes. Not always, 
there are certainly exposures where any of these algorithms would have been fine, but there are exposures where they weren't and where you might wanna choose one or the other based on these measurement properties. Um, I do wanna say that the algorithms with similar performance across uh, race ethnicity that we tend to do better across multiple characteristics, but they are no means foolproof, right? So if you have the ability to kind of check the measurement properties for your particular interest, you should do that. And I also want to note a lot of people think of, oh, well, if I just adjust for all the covariates, this will fix this problem. Doesn't. But if I show you this chart from the adjusted models, it looks exactly the same. So just to kind of give you a concrete example, because I've been talking a lot about methods and, you know, we actually want to do stuff with our methods. We don't want to just enable gaze at our methods because they're fun. They are, but we should do stuff with them. Um, this was the project that kind of started me off on all of this. We wanted to examine whether relative black-white racial disparities and the risk of dementia changed over time. Again, the idea being we need some sort of surveillance system, which we don't have, to understand if we're making progress. Um, given the background of declining risk in dementia in Europe and, the, and, the America, and North America, we wanted to focus on relative disparities. So is that trend accelerating the disparity or is it shrinking the disparity? We used, again, data from the Nationally Representative Health and Retirement Study, used those three new algorithms that I discussed, again, thinking that it was important to have similar measurement properties to minimize the impact of differential measurement error. Because not only did we want to see if the change over time was happening, we also wanted to make sure that the amount of the disparity that we were quantifying wasn't just attributable to measurement error in the, in the uh, instrument. And, and to do this, we looked at the trend in black-white prevalence ratios, instance rate ratios over time, both crudely and also with age standardization because uh, life expectancy changes. So again, lots of dots, but I'll take you through it. Um, on the left side are the crude analyses, on the right side are the standard analyses. The three rows are the three different algorithms because we wanted to make sure we were getting the same answer despite these three different seemingly reasonable options. If we look over at the left, that first dot is the prevalence ratio comparing risk of dementia for Black Americans to white Americans in 2000. The next dot is 2002. And it goes on. The line is just the trend over time, and then the p-value for the trend is there. And you can see we have no statistically significant p's for trends, meaning it's not changing over time. And even that kind of suggestion of a little decrease we see in the crude pretty much disappears when we standardize uh, to account for life expectancy. So the conclusions here is that dementia prevalence in Black Americans is about 1.5 to 1.9 times that in white Americans at the national level, and that there was no evidence to support change in relative prevalence of dementia by race over time. Now, that does mean the absolute prevalence is probably decreasing, but that's just because pre absolute prevalence everywhere is decreasing. Same thing that we have for incidence. So all I've done here is replace prevalence ratios with incidence ratios. And instead of looking at specific years, we're looking at six year epochs. So the first dot is the incidence from 2000 to 2006. The last dot is 2012 to 2016. Very similar conclusions here. So a couple of conclusions for you. Um, inadequate representation in existing samples is a barrier to equitable research. And combining samples is not always the best option for overcoming this issue, right? Mm -hmm. Highly phenotyped samples are often convenient samples. Different confounding structures are potentially interesting. Harmonization difficulties can lead to different films classification. There's heterogeneity of findings across samples from different target populations. Um, and I'm working on some transportability stuff now, and this is really, really hard. So that's not going to solve this for us. Um, I also think that use of algorithmic and claims-based dementia classification does allow use of samples without study-based dementia ascertainment, but you really want to be careful that you understand what you're doing and you have thought about uh, the measurement properties of the instruments that you have. A couple of recommendations. Um, go ahead and combine samples. If you can focus on representative samples derived from defined and preferably the same target populations. Solve issues of bias within sample before you combine. Right? This should be, shouldn't be, shouldn't, shouldn't be controversial. And then harmonized protocols and meta-analysis may be the best approach when combining samples. Um, it addresses, allows you to really easily address the difference in confounding structure. It allows formal assessment of heterogeneity across target populations. And it doesn't limit analyses to variables available everywhere. And in my experience, you don't really use that, lose that much statistical power. 
Algorithmic ascertainment may allow use of large representative data sets for dementia research. You need to understand the measurement properties of the instruments you're using. This does require a validation subsample. So I know there's probably an NIA representative in the room. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Would love another Adams. That would be great. <laughs> um, and creation of a setting specific algorithms may be useful, right? So we did this for our purpose. It's not to say that this is the best or the only option. Use what's available if it's going to work for you. But if it's not, you know, you may need to go down this road. And finally, something that I've noticed in the field as a whole, and I just want to kind of point out, is that claims can be used to identify diagnosed dementia. It is not the same as identifying dementia. And we tend as a field to have a really hard time with nomenclature, right? I mean, anyone who's just tried to define the words Alzheimer's disease lately knows this. Seven different definitions, depending on who you are asking and when they came into the field and how up to date they are in the, the current version of what people are using those words for. Diagnosed dementia is not dementia. There's so much under diagnosis and we wanna be careful when we talk about our outcome and understand the implications. So a little bit of self-promotion. Um, this data, these algorithms are publicly available as submitted data sets on the HRS website. Um, I am updating them. So there'll be a new version of that soon. Uh, I want to thank National Institute of Aging for my funding. The work that I presented here was, was funded by an RO3 and an RO1. Um, I want to thank the faculty, staff, and participants who contributed to all the data sets I've used. You know, I wouldn't be here unless there were a lot of people who did a lot of hard work. Um, and just to kind of put that home, these are the, the funding statements for a lot of those cohorts. It also required a lot of money. And I appreciate that people keep collecting data, even though they're not sure how it's going to be used in the future, because... We always find these. Having data is never a problem. Um, these are the references. I just want to give a quick shout out to Teresa Filstein, who uh, led the simulation um, project, and Kanji Natasio, uh, who worked with me closely on the algorithmic ascertainment project. Um, and these references, they're all published and, and available. And I thank you for your time. You. I want to go with the, the online question first. So since many economists are increasingly using financial decision-making ability, using financial data, bank, and other to speculate diagnosis, risk, progression of dementia, and are managing to get funded with this approach, what would be an epidemiological response to this kind of approach? Can I ask for a clarification? <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds interesting. Like, I mean, I think, you know, and I think you, but you have to be careful with, with anything you do, right? If you're going to start classifying people based on data, you want to make sure that to the extent you can, you're classifying them appropriately. Yeah. Question. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I agree with you that there's a lot of different definitions for a lot of things, depending on who we ask, especially what is race, right? Um, so what, I may have missed it, I apologize, but what is your definition of a representative sample? Uh, a sample from a defined target population that I can enumerate, and I know how I got from that to my sample. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah my presentation should be half in your Yeah, but yeah. Anyways, uh, oh, okay. Do you think so? I think I so uh, some some airport they can compromise um, um, HLA's sister studies, which is international. What, what do you think about that? Should, should we harmonize it, combine it, or should we take a more good approach? I know that people, you know, the HRS harmonized sister studies are designed to make harmonization a lot easier, right? And so I think if you go in from the design perspective, it's way easier to harmonize if you do it at the design stage than at the analysis stage. So for the same, we had an example of the, the Rosmat Mars studies that basically use the identical protocol, those are really easy to combine in some ways in terms of harmonization. Um, the sister studies, you know, we're, we're dealing with different cultural groups, we're dealing with different realities, you know, you want to go into it being very careful and thinking very critically about it and involving people from those countries. Um, I don't really work internationally, so I don't have a good sense of all of the intricacies there, but I do know very smart people are working on that um, and are, are really grappling with those decisions right now. 
So you described when you did basic biases in analysis. So and uh, I'm an epidemiologist, is what I do. Absolutely. <laughs> so and uh, maybe maybe this great biases can be given to black and white when we analyze data. And it means uh, there could be generated some artificial contribution to this data. I mean, that was that was kind of the point of the differential misclassification and, picture. Uh, can we can we have a method to estimate this fraction of artificial Yes, we have. There's a lot of kind of quantitative bias analyses and simulation approaches that could be used for that. Um, there are established ones. There are you know back of the envelope ones. I think they're really useful. The problem that we often have is that our sample sizes are so small. And our estimates start so uncertain that the answer is could bias account for this always, right? It's you know, unless we unless we overcome the sample size issue, we can't a very precise bias estimate is still biased, but a very imprecise bias estimate is really hard to differentiate between the bias and the imprecision, right? So you know, do what you can, keep moving forward. Thank you.